Hello, comrades. You are listening to Kyle's Communist Podcast. My name is Kyle. And on this week's episode, we are continuing our summer theme of breaking up all the tradition. The show usually follows a format of looking at our weekly newsletters, but I've been in the process of reworking and revamping that throughout the month of August. It is already September 3rd, so I, I've got to watch my words here. I'm talking about summer and people are already back to school, so I guess maybe summer is, is officially coming to a close. I don't know what time that actually happens or what date, but I can say it's 7, 8 o'clock in the evening and it's getting dark out already. Oh, there is a lot to cover, but I want to keep it rather brief on this episode just to say previously the newsletter had no mobility of its own. It wasn't actually a newsletter. It did not go out via email Instead, it was just a blog post up on the website, but that doesn't sound as fancy. Now it is actually a newsletter that will be sent out. So I will have a link in the description of this episode for you to go and subscribe. I'm hosting it over on a site called Beehive or Behiv, B-E-H-I-I-V, Behiv. Anyway, Beehive over there will be very nice, I think, in publishing these newsletters. It's always a balancing act in this day and age. Uh, all of these different siloed technologies that are all individually really cool, but really hard to work together. I don't know for any nerds out there who have tried to do sim uh, similar things to me, who have tried to build out websites and the rest in the past. But here's what happens in this kind of capitalist economy we've got of, of gig work and people, companies really coming in and trying to make money off of uh, creators is that you get a bunch of interesting individual products that do not link together. And these could be things like podcast editing tools. It could be blogging tools. It might be shop and merch to tools. I almost said toys there, but all, they are toys. All of these are toys to me as a, a guy of the digital age who really enjoys this and generally enjoys content creation. I just despise that we live in an era of everything being so siloed. Nothing works together. Nothing wants to work together because until there is sort of a purchase to buy out one of these groups, then they don't really have much motivation to start some sort of API link-ins or things like that. It, it's weird just to say that there's cool tech, but it, none of it speaks to each other. And as a guy, oh, for those that don't know, I, I've been really coming to terms this last year that at, at 31, almost 32 years old, I certainly have ADHD at minimum, but I think I have uh, an autism profile called PDA, Pathological Demand Avoidance. Basically, it means... Even the things I want to do, the moment they become a task in my brain, I'd rather jump off a cliff. And I don't say that sarcastically, by the way. That's sort of the interesting thing about this PDA profile is uh, pretty much anything would be better than doing the task at the moment. It's like, oh, you want to, hey, Kyle, you need to go and, 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 and just send a simple newsletter today. I'd rather go get my teeth drilled. <laughs> which is funny because if I need to go to the dentist, I'd rather do anything but go to the dentist. It's just weird how as soon as my brain prioritizes something as a task that needs accomplished and I'm accountable to the outside world, it immediately becomes something frustrating, annoying, and I'm sure there's a bit of a perfectionist sort of mindset in there. I think that kind of ties in with the ADHD as well where I will start a project and I will get it near 75% complete, but knowing that it has to be completed or should be, knowing that it needs to be perfected a bit longer, my brain just says, you know what, let's just not, let's just leave it, let's just let it kind of rot on the vine and walk away. And that's not good. That's not good. If you ever hear me release a somewhat unfinessed, un like a project where there could be a little bit more tweakage to it, just know, know me on a personal level. The reason I'm releasing it early is because I just need to release it. And this is something for people here on the, on the internet, especially is when you're looking at creating YouTube videos or anything like that, there is a concept that you just don't, people don't want to dive right into it until they're going to get it right. Well, other people are putting their stuff out there and a lot of it, 
isn't good. <laughs> Let's be real. If you go around YouTube long enough, there's a lot of content there that is not good. It might have bad audio. It might have bad video. It might have, you know, all kinds of things that just make it undesirable to the larger audience. They're publishing stuff. What's our excuse not to? Right. Oh, our our lighting is a little bit dark in this video. Yeah, that person doesn't even have a light turned on. They're like you. The only thing you're seeing in their video is the screen reflecting off their glasses. You know, I hope you understand what I mean in kind of a fun, friendly way. Kudos to the people that are just doing it uh, to the rest of us that feel like we have these internal hang ups. We just have to come to terms with those. And and my scale sort of varies with them. I I do have standards of the content I don't want to put out. Things that are riddled with typos, things that are just blatantly not done, or there's no uh, kind of interconnect. Maybe I don't have the event set up for the article yet, and I need to do that. There's a lot of excuses. There's a lot of reasoning here. But just to keep it all uh, nice and simple, it is to say, sometimes I got to get that content out so there's something to enjoy. And that brings us back around to why the newsletter has sort of sat in a little bit of a limbo this summer. Ever since I started doing the newsletter, I think it might have been around April. It was linked to a Soviet holiday, and I can't remember exactly which one. Oh, it was May Day. Oh, it was May 1st. Okay, it was right before May 1st. I'm going back in my mind. Yeah, I did a big article for May Day. So May 1st, it is actually Labor Day today, which is really interesting. Wow, that's unintentional. It is September 3rd is May Day. Uh, it is Labor Day here in the United States. I actually want to talk about how May Day and Labor Day are separated from each other. May Day is International Labor Day. And here in the United States, we intentionally, that is to say the capitalist ruling class intentionally screwed this up for people so that they there was a break in the middle, a long break at that from May to September, where our movement is isolated from the rest of the global movement. Again, being very intentional. We'll talk about that a little bit towards the end here as long as I remember. What I want to get at here, though, continuing the newsletter talk, is I started to toy with all kinds of different shapes and formats that the newsletter could follow. Um, generally, let me, let me tell you a lot of the things I like to include. News stories, things that are very important for communists, specifically if it has a, a global tendency to it. I think that's really cool if it has something to do with global comrades. Secondly, I really like to include some sort of arts and culture segment. So I like to include communist music that's coming out. I'm, I'm in, in this latest newsletter highlighting another song drop from the German rapper Vision, who I really like his music. Lots of uh, Lenin iconography in there and USSR iconography. Very, very cool stuff. And then finally, the last thing I like to include, need to do better at, is encapsulating everything else I do. <laughs> Which is to say, there is the newsletter, there is the podcast, there are three book clubs we host per week. And then on top of that, I mean, the sky, sky's the limit. I, I do an Instagram post every day. A lot of Instagram stories. I'm trying to get back on threads. There's a lot. There's a lot going on out there. And this is coming uh, from a guy who, if an item is not right in front of me, ADHD brain here, I forget it exists quite often. Uh, that means I am like, I'm very clinically that person in your life who might buy something and they forget that they have it. You know, if you've ever got parents, this has really made me reevaluate stuff. If you ever have parents or family members, maybe aunts, uncles, grandparents, whatever, that you might look at them and say, oh, you know, hey, you, you already have one of these. Why'd you go out and buy one? And then they'd say, oh, I forgot I had it. As a child, that sounded silly to me, but as an adult... I see it as a very serious and very frustrating mental condition, which you can treat with ADHD meds. And if the money comes my way, maybe I will do that. But the long story to, to kind of bring this to some sort of close and summary is to say, if an item's not in front of me, even if I bought that item just a week ago and I love it, it's very cool. If it's not in front of me, if it's not visual to me, that means I, I, I can forget I've got it at all. And the more boring the item, the more mundane to your house, you know, let's say it's a tool that's just needed or maybe it's a cleaning product that you don't have to regularly get out. I, I just completely lose track of, of where those things are and if I even have them. I'm, really, I was just doing some taxes the other day, wrapping up some mid-year stuff for the business and um, just meaning like for all this online stuff. 
uh, about to send that in. And I I saw some things on my Amazon list I bought previously that I, I just don't remember. I'm like, wow, I've got... And now I'm drawing a blank on even what it was. So bad story. But the point is, I was going down the list and I just saw item after item. I'm like, oh, I've got that. Oh, yeah, that's tucked away. And I got to say, the downside to all of this is that what's the obvious solution to it? Leave a lot of this stuff out, <laughs> which I'm a guy who also hates a cluttered desk. But, you know, if the difference of you not knowing you've got a remote for something or not knowing that you've got... Um, Oh, I don't even know what to use as an example, but, you know, maybe I don't know. I've got pens here. Well, if they're not where they're supposed to be or, or, or that's just out of sight, it literally truly is out of mind for me. And this all comes back to say that when working on all these different projects online, you can imagine how quickly they fall through the gaps. Uh, another hard thing about ADHD is we do not build habits like other people do. Scientifically, we do not build habits like other people do, which, oh, I wish I knew I had ADHD as a kid. I wish I wish I had seen the, the signs back then. It would have saved me from decades of just generally trying and sort of subtly guilting myself like, oh, why don't you just, you know, we need to we need to commit to that, Kyle. Come on. And then only to learn. Oh, yeah. Us as ADHD people, because our brain doesn't fire with the same neurochemical patterning, uh, we don't get the same dopamine hits or we don't get the same sort of euphoria for certain events, et cetera, et cetera. Like things that keep people going on a normal routine. We don't have those kind of reward factors and or because it goes different ways for different people. Uh, another aspect that I've heard someone else call out on YouTube a lot is saying that for us, every single task within like every subtask within a larger task every single subtask for us is a major ordeal that again ties in with that pda profile out there which is just again when you've got to do something it becomes harder for no real apparent reason other than the brain does not want to compute and comply so uh if it's something like producing a podcast even though I have the skill to record a podcast and edit it quickly, I've, I've, I've come, I've, I've found shortcuts for many of these things, shortcuts that are quality and they work for me, but still there are quite a few days, meaning every week or every other week, when I go to publish a podcast episode that my body is just, it would rather... I don't know, go lay in the street or something. I, I, I almost, I kind of quiz myself, my, my, my senses at these times when I've got something to do and I don't want to do it. I, I've started sort of a new pattern game where I'm like, well, what would you rather do instead? <laughs> you want to, you, you know, you want to go on a, a five mile run or something? And my body again, even though I would hate that, it's like, well, you know, it sounds a lot better than doing the podcast right now. So uh, anyway, I hope this kind of gives a little bit of insight. But it's also is why I want to reach out to people. And I'm so interested in making more of a team effort here with the newsletter, with the podcast and beyond is now that you have a little bit of insight into how my brain works. I hope you can also see why I have implemented the systems I've got. The book club exists because if not for the regular meeting times, I probably would not read as much theory throughout the week. Largely because I would just forget. <laughs> I would get stuck watching, I don't know, today I was watching a video on YouTube about a man repairing watches. Very cathartic, very relaxing, very fun, and a little bit educational too. But still, I will get stuck doing anything but the task. And that is why we do the book club the way we do it. We do it in a fashion that gets people to commit to a schedule. And and recently we've made our Discord book club only. That has ruffled a little bit of feathers, but not many and, and not the wrong feathers at that. Book club being mandatory for our Discord server, that people on the Discord must attend three out of 12 book clubs per month. We offer 12 sections. They have to hit three of them. Very easy. That's three hours a month of commitment, which I'm going to be honest. If you can't commit three hours to a Discord server per month, you shouldn't be on the Discord server. <laughs> I mean, not just mine, but everyone. We all should do a good social hygiene thing where it's like, look, if you're not active in a Discord server, just leave it. I know some people out there with hundreds of them. 
in their in their uh, folders. And it's just man, un 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 undo, <laughs> undo, leave, jump. Uh, uh, not every server is like this. For the record, I should I should bring in some scale and scope to this, which is to say, I'm in plenty of Q and A servers for apps and services and things like that. Of course. It would be better if I weren't in them. You know, I don't want to be in there. I'm only in there to get service or help with a program. I'm looking at like our Me6 bot as an example. Stream Elements, which is part of the Twitch stream there on there and a couple others. But for our server, which is rather niche and, um, well, I think that's the word for it. It's niche. We want a high quality of membership. Higher quality than quantity. Because being honest, we've got... I think out of 500 and some members on the server, 40 that are very active throughout the week, I think is, is what the numbers come in to say. And I don't know if that's good or bad. I mean, the percentages, that is, the percentages are what they are. I was going to make up a different phrase, but that's the right way to say it. The percentages are what they are. Every group out there has their own specific thing. Uh, you know, the, 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 the margin's going to be different depending on what the task is. And for us, we want that to be a high percentage of active members, even if that means there's less of them. And here's the, here's the real bread and butter. Here's the real secret sauce as to why I want less general members and more active members. It is because one of the largest problems confronting the Western communist movement, the English-speaking communist movement, is... LARPers, people who are role-playing being communists. Live action role-play. That's what LARP stands for. Now, I don't want people to think that I'm out on a witch hunt just to start this off. There is a use for LARPing. People role-playing, people subtly familiarizing themselves with concepts, slowly starting to wear the clothing, slowly starting to do the, the, the tasks, to walk the walk, to talk the talk. LARPing can be a very notable part of someone's growth in just becoming anything. I mean, I look back to my life and this is how I've sort of changed hobbies and habits is sort of subtly picking them up and subtly moving more into them. Then it's not so subtle. Now it's a lot. But the thing that I really want to talk about when we talk or when we comment on LARPers is this bad habit of just... I feel bad. A lot of a lot of teenagers now, uh, sad they have the camera pointed at them. I'm, I'm thankful I got through my LARPing days before smartphones were such a thing. But they are being memorialized for their ignorance on the Internet. And listen, if you're out there and you're you self identify as a LARPer and you're listening to this, I just want to say you're already doing more than most. If you're listening to a podcast that's a angled like this, you are doing significantly more than any other LARPers out there. When I was younger, and by the way, this is a relevant communist conversation here, that when I was 17, 18 and getting into communism the first time, this is 2009-ish, smartphones were not a thing. YouTube was only out for two years then. At that stage, let's remember that you had to have a special YouTube account in the high rankings to even be able to put up a, a video longer than like 10 minutes. Just so everyone knows, YouTube, you, you could not post these long 30 minute videos or something longer. So I just, this is important because education was not as accessible as it is now. Communist sites, though Marxist.org hasn't changed since then, uh, communist sites were a lot less prevalent. There were a lot less online groups. It was mostly forum based. And so when I was young, I, I just remember not having a lot of access to good education about communism and socialism. And so I was a LARPer of circumstance. That is to say, I found myself really interested. I was very interested in the history of World War II, specifically from a, a Soviet Union perspective. I, I knew that the story, kudos to Pascal. He could already tell at the time that the, the U.S. story, that like, we just won, we won, we won, we won, we did it. I already knew back then in 2009 that that was not working. That couldn't be the case. Uh, the statistics are rather clear. Uh, but again, there just wasn't a, a good breadth of material to get to. Let's remember that even sites like Amazon I, I weren't up and running at the scale they are now. Everything was harder to get. I remember looking at books 
about the USSR, thinking I might buy some of them, sort of expensive, like $50 kind of hardback, maybe even more money. These would have been almost like college level books, academic books on the subject. And I, at the time, I was sort of a Stalin boy. I knew nothing of Lenin other than the most uh, peripheral sort of like Lenin improved the Soviet Union a lot. But then that was sort of it. Then everything moves to talk about Stalin. Lenin's gone. History, you know, the U.S. history doesn't talk about him. And so I was considering buying these books on Stalin. Thank goodness I didn't waste my money because now knowing most of them would have been academic trash. Just full out libelous garbage. And you know I'm not even a Stalin boy anymore. So I have no reason to defend uh, them slandering Stalin other than to say, look, these are capitalist academics. They don't care about getting it right. They care about getting paid. There's a big difference there. So moving on, I, I, on my path of LARPing, recognized, you know, I was trying to get these books, but I couldn't, I couldn't afford them. I, there wasn't good resources on the internet, though there was Marxist.org. And here befalls, or here, here comes one of the other pitfalls of Stalin that befell me, which is I thought, okay, well, let me go read some Stalin. Well, go to Marxist.org, look at the list, and holy crap, does Stalin say a lot, and wow, is it poorly written. It's not engaging, it's not original, it's not critical, it's not really worth your time. <laughs> uh, I mean, we, we often make jokes about that in the Discord server, that, that there is a lot of just absolute drivel that came out of either Stalin's hand or more likely ghostwriters. More likely ghostwriters, but so be it, whatever. All I can say is Stalin served, even though I was admiring him at the time, he served as a massive roadblock for me in getting deeper into communism. And I hope you're maybe starting to understand a bit more of my story, my background, my history as I retell this to you, because you have to understand this is the lens I'm looking at all these modern LARPers with, which is to say, these are mostly young adults, mostly. Let's just give them the, the average age of sort of 18. Uh, predominantly or primarily, these people are probably 15 to 24, 15 to 24, maybe 15 to 25, whatever. It was, you know, 15 to 25, let's say that. I would guess it's mostly in that window because shortly after that, people have to get out in the real, real world, even outside of college, and they have to be serious. And that's when kind of the LARPing generally goes away that's where sort of the wearing an ushanka hat and all these other very mm, uh very stereotypical things tend to go away and that's good that's good because if you out there listening to this and you again self-identify as a larper i'm glad you're here because i will let i will save you the embarrassment that will be thrown upon you if you don't and and that is to say unfortunately for as cool as ushankas are for as cool as modern ushankas are that people are actively wearing in russia like young 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 friends of mine in their 20s got really cool ushankas uh ours the type we see over here for the memes it's such a meme it's such a joke and anyone that wears one is a joke and i have three of my own and i'm gonna tell you it's a joke and if you're wearing them all the time you're a joke you can change that, though. I'm not saying you're intrinsically, holistically a joke. You're not, you as an individual are, I am not sitting here laughing at you, but the moment you put that hat on, you are putting clown makeup on, so do be very cautious about that. The same goes for me. If I put the hat on, I'm wearing clown makeup, just like you and me. We're doing it together, except let's not. Let's not do it together, because getting out of LARPing is so much more rewarding. What's at the end? What are the toys? What's the treasure? What's to look forward to? Why take off the clown makeup? Well, I think for me, one of the coolest is that without having learned a lot of Russian, but getting out there and talking and making content about Soviet history, I've had a lot of English speaking Russian people, and, and I'm not, not just from Russia, but the, the ex-Soviet states, Russian speakers come to me and share so much of their history, pictures of their family, uh, pins of their, their family. I've had so many friends live on TikTok and other things open up kind of bags or drawers of their, their parents, grand, uh, grandparents more likely, Soviet pins and just show us what they got. Or another guy 
uh, wanted to send me a lot of stamps that his father had collected when he was a kid. Uh, beautiful, gorgeous Soviet stamps. That, I will tell you, is so much more rewarding than any sort of LARP you will ever do. I mean, I can say this with with not only my, well, with my personal anecdote, but also just on paper, statistically, think about it. Think to yourself, is that cheap-ass hat you bought, is that equivalent to earning the respect of somebody that had family that served in the Red Army or something equivalent? It's not. Let's be real with each other. It's not. The one's a kid's game. That's the hat. Take it off. The other is actual serious proletarian internationalism getting to know your comrades abroad right it's it's the end of the game it's the real levels now it's the meaningful stuff and these relationships have taught me so so much i mean they're the reason i'm still here doing this content is because uh, so many doors have opened to me just by pursuing them and pursuing them honestly pursuing them without the clown makeup Got to take the makeup off. No one's going to take you seriously. No one's going to trust you. That's the thing. They won't trust you. And I don't either. Because so long as you're dressed like a clown, we must treat you like a clown. And the moment you want to get serious, you'll take the clown makeup off and join the rest of us in book club studying theory. Because the great part about it, and here's, here's where I was terrified, terrified as a young adult. I somehow thought, the communist theory was going to teach me that all of the bad things about the USSR were actually true. I thought that studying theory was somehow going to ruin this utopian view of communism I had in my head, that it would plunge me into a world of chaos and despair and it is all gulags and it is all bread lines the whole way down. Surprise, it's actually none of that. Nope, complete opposite, 100%. Whoop. And this is again why we must force LARPers to mature now. Even if they're not ready yet, it's time to mature now because the only thing holding them back is them. And they have so much to gain. They only need to lose their chains. They have a world to win, right? To paraphrase the Communist Manifesto in there. With so many benefits awaiting these people, with international comrades being interested to talk to them, with themselves uh, prioritizing history over role play, that's massive. I mean, the propaganda these people can pump out for us, right? Once they become actual communists, not role-play communists, they are the lifeblood of this movement. I mean, I am, an, I, I am just speaking from personal experience that I went from pseudo-LARPing it. I never had any sort of false intention, just by the way. I, I guess there are probably LARPers out there. I don't think there's many communist LARPers that are completely faking. Well... Patriotic socialist, Kyle. Patriotic socialist. Yeah, but I don't think that they... I don't think that they think that they're role-playing. <laughs> they are role-playing. They don't know it. They are fascist role-playing in red. They don't know that yet. And these people, these LARPers, are not exactly the same. I want, I'm, 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 this is coming to me as I'm talking to you all. I hope this is educational. But I'm drawing a line in the sand saying, eh, truly uneducated LARPers that are coming at communism for the first time and they're wearing their Ushankas and they've got their, you know, things painted in red and they've got all the stickers and they've got all the music on their phone. We hope that they will become real communists and they will become real communists only when they engage in the regular, consistent and critical reading of Marxist theory. And putting it into practice, doing that praxis. However, if they do not go the route of reading, that is where they will get usurped and sucked up into some fake movement. They will either become patriotic socialists and think they understand socialism and communism while in practice actually butchering it, making a perverse, bloody mockery of it, stabbing it to death in front of an audience. Or they will just become straight-up fascists. There's really no, no meaningful difference between 
the neo-fascist movement that we have now and the supposed patriotic socialist movement. They are both against class war. They are both in favor of a culture war. It does not matter that they don't use the words. Look at what they're actually doing with it, right? These are people that are advocating a culture war. And so they are subverting and destroying the Marxist movement in that way. And this is, again, why I'm saying we need to sort of force these younger, not even age, that's not relevant. It's not about the number of age. It's about sort of the maturity level of them, whether they are 15 or 25, doesn't matter for the maturity. You can have 15-year-olds that are significantly more mature than 55-year-olds. There's Actually, I think that's probably more common these days in all seriousness. And that's why I will go so far as to say, again, we need to make sure we're there catching these people. Now speaking about age for a number for a second, but also maturity too, we, we need to catch these folks before others do. Fascists are out there trying to. Fascists are all about indoctrinating kids. On the flip side, we need to be there to open their eyes. Uh, ours is an indoctrination. Ours is the scrubbing away of the the scale over the glasses. You know, we're 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 getting rid of the fog, the haze, the the goop that's on there. It's time for a car wash. Let's get things sprinkled clean because uh, otherwise, again, they're gonna wind up in those neo fash camps because they're gonna think things like. <gasps> Well, the Jews are actually the ones destroying our, the economy. Uh, idiot. Absolute idiot. No, it's the capitalist right there who's laughing as he goads you into attacking Jewish people. You're weakening yourself as you're weakening your community, and you're only going to be more prey, a weaker prey, or maybe even a more exotic prey for your new overlord that sees how desperately you want to lick their boots. And that's why we need to be there to help those people. Again, spray off the film, clean it off, pressure wash them. We need these people to understand how capitalism works, how its propaganda works, and we need to get, we need to get everyone in the same direction. We were reading some great works by Lenin the other day in book club. I believe it was Letters to Robocha Gazeta, uh, Letters to Workers Newspaper, um, really interesting works from Lenin talking about where the movement sat in Russia at the time, and it looks so similar to here in the United States. Uh, we're behind Lenin in, in terms of things to come. He, at this stage of these writings, is talking about book clubs being an amateurish thing and that they need to form stronger bodies, larger bodies, connect, become less individual in your cell work. Instead, link these cadres and cells to larger parties. That way, we're not all running in different directions. We're not herding cats. We're not chasing ourselves around the room. Instead, we're walking lockstep, directly facing our adversary. We are not at that stage yet of linking up at large because right now we've got a big hole in the boat where all the intellect is draining out. We are not as a, as a communist, as a movement, as a political entity, as a class consciousness concept, we are not mature enough. We are not strong enough. We are not ready yet. We're trying and we're going to be ready. Don't take this as a pessimistic thing. No, no, no. You don't have time to be pessimistic. This is coming for you whether you are ready or not. That's the thing, right? You listener, this will happen to you if you're ready or prepared or not. You put your head in the sand, but that's only going to hurt you. You're only going to be less ready compared to your peers. What I mean to say is, as the material conditions around us collapse, people are seeing the value of socialism and communism really, really quickly. The statistics are so there that the United States government is worried about this. Hence their house denunciation of socialism. Hence Florida saying that communist Marxists, etc., that go there will be physically unsafe for their lives. Trump saying that he is going to ban and bar foreign communists from coming to the country, but also crack down further on communists here. This is all reactive to how strong we are becoming. We are so strong, so united, so, well, maybe you're not united, but we are so strong that they fear us uniting, and that is why the crackdown must happen now or soon, because if they let us unite, ugh, 
that spells bad things for their retention of power. So let's also rephrase what is a LARPer? What are these people who are not actively part of the communist movement? Well, in a pessimistic sense, if you'll come down that alley with me for a second, these people, completely unknown to them, are agents working in favor of capitalism. That is to say, again, of no direct fault of some of them, they are playing the role of a clown. They are out front of our establishment. They're scaring people away from it. And we're wondering why, you know, hey, why aren't the other people coming to the table and, you know, being serious? Why is, why is no one coming in? Why aren't they getting their communist badges? Oh, yeah, look out front. There's a whole group of clowns out there dancing and setting themselves on fire and, uh, you know, just being generally vulgar and uncool. <laughs> I, I got to say this. I know this isn't exactly a Marxist thing, maybe. But we do need to use every tool at our disposal and understanding the cool factor is a part of it. We must be forming cadres, groups and parties that are respectable. And I, I'm using the word cool, very slang colloquially here to mean people must desire to be a part of them. They must feel pride in being a part of that party, because if they don't feel pride in being a part of the party, then they're not going to be a part of the party. They're either going to sign up and walk away or they're not going to sign up at all. So here's the question. Who do you want to be your comrade? Do you want it to be people out there that are dressed like clowns, acting like fools, scaring people away? Or do you want those real comrades who also have standards like you and who are smart enough on their own to say, I don't hang out with clowns, so I'm not going in there. That's part of the challenge we face. A lot of those people who are seeing the clowns and walking away are a group I would like to call loose liberals, people born in the United States predominantly who recognize conservatism is very dangerous. And they look at Democrats and liberalism and they say, well, this isn't the answer either. But if I've only got to choose between cherry red and blueberry blue, then, well, I guess I'll take the blueberry Democrats over there because it's the, the best I got. Also reference to me and something I still see out there a ton. That was me when I was getting out there uh, right after college. And I'm like, ah, you know, I wish I could be back to being a socialist, communist minded person. But there's there's not good stuff. There's not good foundations for it. I was sort of waiting for the adult world to sort of grab me by the arm and pull me towards something meaningful. And all these years later, what I've learned is it doesn't exist you got to make it yourself because let's be real, folks. If you're here listening to this, it's this is not such a this is not me being egotistical about what we're all doing here. What we're doing is the base minimum. We, though, are the minority doing the base minimum. A lot of the other people aren't doing anything at all. There are a lot of so-called communists out there. There's even less so-called communists doing the reading. Does that make sense? I don't even know if I put that into words that makes any kind of sense in order. But it is to say, there are a lot of people out there calling themselves a communist in name and doing nothing but dancing around on the internet. That is the only thing they're doing to try to legitimize it. And now here I am as a guy who's homebound talking to you about getting off the internet. I want to make some little iteration here clear, some little just statement. We all have a part to play and not all of these parts to play are out there in the streets. Any so-called communist who says, if you're not out there in the streets, man, you're not doing it. You're not doing you're nothing. Shut up. That person isn't worth your time. Do not listen to them. They are too ignorant to understand the strategy that we should not all be cattle in the street waiting for slaughter. If we're serious about revolution, it isn't just about, well, let's all stand in a line and just wait. <laughs> let's wait for the, I don't know, the police to arrest us all. Let's be real, folks. Come on. Strategy is not about just packing people into the streets. And to any of these organizations out there that are so self-blinding, meaning they're, they're blinding themselves, staring into some great light in front of them. Maybe they're staring into the sun. But I see them taking good, 
members that make digital designs and all kinds of other stuff. And they're just aimlessly throwing people around. They're not paying attention to the strengths of their members. And that bothers me because, again, it makes me think of that like, we all going to go in there in the streets, man. We need lookouts. We need people doing communication work. We need people that are sabotaging elements that are coming to the main protest. You know what I'm saying? The main protest that everyone out there in the streets is the distraction. I'm saying the quiet part out loud. <laughs> I really am. I'm saying the quiet part out loud. But if I don't say it, I don't think anyone's going to get it. We need to be more strategic from every step in your life. Start thinking strategically from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to bed. Because guess what? If you're not, other people are. Maybe this is just the autism speaking here. That it does grant me a great perspective in seeing systems that don't work. And one of those systems is people dreaming for a revolution and yet doing nothing to make it happen. And it's especially a crime now. By the way, that's a word that Lenin likes to use is to say it's a crime for people during revolutionary time to squander the potential for he, he talks often throughout various texts that we've read in book club that when when the time comes, so many people are going to be unprepared because they were doing nothing at all. And though it would be good to say, hey, everyone, you should all go out there and plant your own garden. You should all become self-sufficient. You should all live off the grid. You should all do this. You should. That's not how it's going to happen. That is not serious. That is, that is the thing. That is not serious. For the people that can do it, hallelujah, we're going to need folks like you. But don't be so ignorant or naive as to say, well, everyone must. No, everyone must not. Everybody has a role to play, and that role is going to be niche to them. And again, if you're too ignorant, if you're too self-deceived or arrogant, egotistical to see other people's strengths, well, guess what? You're a bad leader by definition. If you cannot see the strength of the people that are around you, you are not leadership material. <laughs> guess what? I'm not the first person to say that. That goes back generations. If you cannot see the strength in your comrades, then you are not fit to lead. Because to lead in any way, whether that's creating your local cell, whether that's being active in online spaces, whatever it is, you need to understand what skills people bring to the table and you need to understand what things make them uncomfortable. Because what you shouldn't be doing, and this is where I was criticizing organizations a second ago, is you should not be taking your people who are great at graphic design and terrible interpersonal skills and saying, well, you know what? You got to go out there in the streets and you got to go hand out these flyers. Stop it. Stop putting our worst people on the front lines. Drill more holes in the boat, why don't you? Are you working for the fascists? I mean, who's paying these bills? I am just so annoyed because I see this even from organizations that I like and trust out there that just do not play smart. And that's why I say I'm not sure if this is the autism thing where I'm like, this is so obvious. It's so obvious, gang. It's so obvious. But yet it isn't to the people that are in these decision making positions. And it bothers me because we're leaving a lot of revolutionary potential on the table. We're leaving a lot of revolutionary potential on the table. One organization that I'm going to call out by name because I do sort of like them, but I do think this is a big problem, is IMT. I do like international Marxist tendency here in the United States. I don't declare myself a Trotskyist by any means. You know me. I'm a Leninist. I'm not a Stalinist. I just walk the Lenin line because I think the problem is people are not reading Lenin. And if, well, people aren't reading Marx, Engels, or Lenin, and they're just jumping into later stuff, which means they're skipping all of the necessary fundamentals. And instead, they're playing around in frou frou frill frill land where everything's fun, idealist adventurism because there's no actual meat and potato theory. So we don't need to build a house on a foundation. We just build the house up in the sky. Gravity doesn't exist, right? shocker it does and if you were paying attention you'd know <laughs> i hope i hope other people out there are laughing and i hope you're feeling a little bit of catharsis through all of this because if you're if you've ever been angry or frustrated about it i want you to know again we do live in a world where we've got a lot of patients running the mental health facility 
And I am, that's, that's an almost un-PC phrase these days, but it is actually fundamentally true. That is, again, to say we do live in a world where we actually have diagnosed psychopaths and sociopaths out there, or diagnosable, people that have various dangerous conditions, not just those two that we all know of, but even some just more subtle things. These folks are our politicians. They are our leaders. They are police. They are all these things. These are the people who are making decisions for society. So again, I say we live in a situation where we actually have verifiable, committable mental patients who are instead writing our laws, carrying out acts of violence against adults and children, and regularly, 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 there's blood on the pavement as a result. This isn't a fairy tale. This isn't a storybook. There are people dying daily, daily. So to the LARPers that are out there, it's time to get serious. Now, to anyone out there that is a LARPer, I just want you to know this all comes with love because like I said, I was you at one point. But the big difference between then and now, or at least the difference I tell myself, pardon, pardon old man, 30-year-old Kyle the geezer here. When I was in high school, we did not have Nazis killing people to the degree we do now. We did not have Nazis attacking the power grid. We did not have candidates so openly endorsed like Ron DeSantis is in Florida with Nazis out in the street corners, very organized, very well dressed. Like they have their theme, they have their aesthetic. I mentioned the cool factor, right? These guys have the cool factor. Doesn't work on me. I think it's gross. But to other people, it works because they're sleek. They're organized, they're efficient, it works well. They're not 15-year-old Ushanka-wearing LARPers on the internet. We need to do better. And I'll be honest, a lot of this has to do, but please, please channel that fandom in the back of your head. I need you to think, how does culture work? If you haven't thought about this, you really need to. Again, study, study, study. Study like Lenin. There's no excuse. Study. How does the cool factor work? Now, I'm not expecting you to have the right answer. There's various answers. But you need an answer. Because we need to learn to master it. And maybe you're not great. Maybe you're not cool. <laughs> and that's not your strong suit. That's sort of okay. I mean, you should still have an idea how this works. Right? It's one thing to be bad at something. And it's another to still know how it works. So you do need to know. But if mastering the cool thing isn't your jam, start talking to people in your life that are better at it. That's what this is about too, is learn to use the strength and skill of the comrades that are around you. You must. It's not optional. This is all connected together. And that's why I really want to now go back to the whole Pat Sock thing. I've, I've talked for so long, and I really hope you've enjoyed this because this episode has been great for me. I've really enjoyed this. Patriotic socialists are people who... Well, how do we even start on this? <laughs> you can hear me talk about patriotic socialists in many different episodes in the past. Patriotic socialists uh, are synonymous with MAGA communism these days. Make America great again, communism. Which, to anyone who's read any theory, you know that statement does not work together. America was never great. It's always been a colonial power, meaning the colony, it was colonized by Western Europeans that came over. They created charters. They stole the land. They forced indigenous people off of the land. In other cases, they tor tortured and mutilated them. They destroyed their religious aspects and, and um, spiritual monuments and the rest. We decimated peoples and not just one. We continued this trend. So when was America great? Was it great when we were killing the indigenous people? Was it great when we shipped over indentured servants from Western Europe? Was that great? Was it great then when we started bringing slaves over and killing them anytime it suited us? 
was it great when Irish, Czechoslovaks, and other white people came to the United States and we threw them into the dredges, treated them like animals? I mean, when was this great? What we're actually talking about here is the myth of whiteness in a way, right? This idea that what we treat now as white is a patriarchal, capitalist, colonial amalgamation to trick people who were once enslaved into loving their masters because at least they're white, so at least they have some power still. Gotta hold on to that at all costs. Whatever. The joke is that if you just realize that that's the problem, you'd be a lot stronger. Join the rest of us. Stop cloying to your pathetic your pathetic power crystals. Put down your battery bank and just join the rest of us at the main. Stop playing games over there. Uh, so what are patriotic socialists? These are supposed socialists, supposed communists who think that to build communism in the modern age, we must reach all of the masses. Full stop. Which, I'm sort of laughing here, pardon me, sounds good on paper. Yeah, reach the masses. Except they have no standards and they have no intention to educate. So what do those two variables mean when we say we're going to educate, or I'm sorry, when we're going to rouse all the masses, but we're not going to have quality control and we're not going to educate them? Well, boy, that really sounds like we're about to just grab everyone into the movement. Ku Klux Klanners, MAGA racists, DeSantis Nazis, because these are the real working class. Um, no, no, they're not. No, they're not. And anyone that's read theory would know that they're not. These are people who are active class traitors and many of them hopefully will be brought over to our side but it will not happen so long as we laugh at the idea of education and so long as we continue to have no standards remember what i said earlier rewind how i said that out front they're all the larpers acting like clowns and so people with real quality are scared away guess who doesn't join patriotic socialist movements real communists want to know why because they see it's a LARP. They see it's a joke. They see there's no meat and potatoes theory to it. It's all just idealist, adventurist filth. And it's filth because they're proposing outright alliances with Nazis. They don't have any scruples or shame about it because these people aren't actually pursuing the growth of Marxism. Instead, they're only about increasing their own clout. I received a great compliment today from a moderator in the Discord server that says, Kyle's one of the only leftist personalities I follow because he's one of the only people telling people to actually read theory, not trying to build a fan base. And I appreciate the hell out of that. Because as a lonely guy living, you know, that's, that's trapped at home, I, I do love building community. I do love getting people to surround and engage with this. But I do not... Do not want everyone. Oh, no, no. I have standards. I have standards. And if you will not read theory, you're out. <laughs> you're out. You're out. You're out. You're out. Because theory is affordable. It's free. It's easy to do. It's an audio form on the internet. And some of the readings are only like 10 minutes long. So like you got that time. You're pissing and shitting or taking a shower. Turn it on. You know what I mean? This stuff is so accessible that we can't stand these excuses anymore. They're intolerable excuses. And that's what these patriotic socialists kind of peddle is like, well, we got to have the full masses, man. Those dudes are racist, man, whatever. We're not supposed to stand up for that damn BLM, LGBT, queer, blah, 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 blah. And this is where their conversation, where you actually see their real character, because notice the talking points I just shouted out. That's what's underneath. When you start challenging these folks, these patriotic socialists, when you challenge them on theory, 
it turns into dog whistles for the alt-right underneath. This is why LARPers must be moved away from it sooner than later, because if they do not know where the theory ends, they will assume it is all theory and all true. Let me reiterate that. Patriotic socialists have memorized a certain amount of theory. They, they know how to code switch it well enough. They themselves are, again, role-playing as a communist, and they're, they're more dedicated than the ignorant LARPers. Those poor ignorant LARPers just don't know yet. That's, that's who I was, again, 10 years ago. Those, those truly ignorant. Not ignorant as in, like, you're a fucking stupid person. Ignorant as in, they just don't know yet. Ignorant to the knowledge. So those ignorant LARPers, we hope they'll make it there. We hope they'll understand what theory is, and that will happen by engaging with it. Unless they follow the patriotic socialists who again their theory runs out really quickly and it turns into anti-semitism it turns into homophobia it turns into transphobia and as you've heard me say in these past couple episodes it's not light it's not like a it's not like a it's not like oh he's a leftist but he's still a little bit of a homophobe because he just doesn't get it no 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 not at all these are people who are full up equating LGBT people to pedophiles, to, um, I saw one of them that Midwestern Marks really likes to rub up against. Um, oh, that guy's rubbing on, on, in, on Twitter, Shai, Shai, Shui, Shai Gu, something like that. Anyway, uh, that guy thinks that trans people are, are, are Hitlerite Nazis, um, and his, his excuse for it is he has pictures of Nazis cross-dressing, which, you know, I really got to ask. This, this is the first time I've thought of it. But how, why do you have pictures of Nazis cross-dressing? I've studied history. Again, 32 almost. I, I've been interested in history since I was 15. And up until that stage, I never saw cross-dressing Nazis. And that just makes me wonder, what part of the Internet do you hang out on that that's a thing? Because I'll, I'll reiterate this part, too. We're reading theory. We're engaging with the masses. We're doing the work. And I'm still not seeing that stuff. So it just it makes me think, like, that that's not being a communist, that you just are into that on a fetish level. I'm thinking you're just perusing that on your own time. But that's my just supposition. I don't know. I just get the heebie-jeebies and... Now you hopefully have them too. But I'm guessing you also, dear listener, have also probably not found cross-dressing Nazis. <laughs> I'm guessing you didn't open any of Lenin's books. It was like, oh, wow, look at this. Maybe I should share this on Twitter. Idiots, idiots, absolute idiots. Idiots, idiots, dangerous, bloody, murderous idiots. Idiots that we do not have time or patience for. Because again, I want to remind you, uh, someone out there is going to be like, well, Kyle's mean. He calls people idiots. He's arrogant. I've got that excuse and I like it because I will be arrogant so long as we have black people being shot in the streets by Nazis. And that is happening day in and day out. It just happened a few days ago where a guy with swastikas drawn on his gun, scratch, scratched into the gun, went and shot and killed, I believe, three to four black people down in Florida, a state that openly endorses fascist activity. And we have patriotic socialists who are arguing that we should ally with them. These people are despicable and they must be removed, not only from the internet, but our real life society as well. There is no room to tolerate this extreme violence. People are dying and it is optional that they're playing hands in the blood, squishing organs. They're doing it for clout. They're bathing in the blood of our comrades so they can get interviews? Looking at you, Midwestern Marks, your group is a sham and a shame. For anyone out there that is still torturing themselves by being in that circle, in that orbit, it's time to ask yourself a serious question in the mirror. Are you a communist or are you LARPing too? Because if you're not reading theory, if you're not engaging, if you can't see through their deceptive lies, I'm sorry to say, but you are the sheep you're afraid of being. And that's not a phrase I like to use lightly. I don't like to call people sheep. I find that term to be distasteful. But there is a stage where people are allowing themselves to fall into this ignorance. And I hope I've 
demonstrated a little bit of that journey tonight that we used to, for us that are a little bit older, 10 years ago, we could say, the internet doesn't have as great resources. We can't just easily find this stuff. It's out of my peripheries. I don't see it. I don't know it exists. Nowadays, communism is everywhere. Let's be real. It's scratched into the light posts on the street. There's stickers. There's your college campus is covered in stickers telling people to get serious and get involved. What is the excuse? Read theory. I know it's not as fun and sexy as Netflix, but then you need to start setting up personal goals and boundaries in your life to say, well, you know what? Unless I read an hour of theory, I can't watch Netflix tonight. It's called being an adult. It's called being mature. And I'm sorry to parent, but these are, you know who I'm talking to most of all? Myself from 10 years ago. So if this is sticking, if it, if, it, if it means something to you, whether your personal life or your friends, I hope, I hope this message resonates. I, like I said, I'm criticizing the old me. And by the way, that tactic of um, do your homework before you watch your stuff, that's an old college trick. Oh, I hate this class. Well, you can watch an episode of Doctor Who after you complete a, a chapter of this book. It works. Maybe not for you, but for other people, find what works for you. Because again, Blood is being spilled. Every time we're just simply prioritizing the escapism from communism, it's not good enough. It really, it really isn't. There's another thing I wanted to say briefly. I mentioned IMT later, don't, or yeah, earlier in the episode. Don't know if I actually got to the meat and potatoes. I just wanted to say that I really like a lot of what that group's doing, especially they're um, doing a lot of campus canvassing right now as people are back to school. I think that's wonderful. Uh, they Serious criticism of IMT, and if I ever get IMT listeners out there, please take this forward. IMT does not in the United States see online work as real work. That's unexcusable. Come on, folks. We are pumping billions of dollars through the internet. This whole horseshit game of it's online, it's not real. Shove that up your digital ass because it is real. And people are taking those dangerous ideologies, these fascist groups, they meet on there and they take it in the real world and they kill people. So it is real and you need to stop lying to yourself. Stop being some idealist. Oh, it doesn't, it's not real. And IMT, you're guilty of this because I would like to join, but the IMT is not accepting members that cannot make it to physical meetings. Well, guess what? Hate to say it, that's ableism right there. They're trying to do it post-COVID. They have a good excuse for it. And this is the reason I'm talking about it is because I want them to change. I'm talking about this not to make fun of them, but to say, look, you got a huge issue and you need to address it. Not the next meeting, now, now, urgently now, next couple weeks now. Need to address this fact that they do not let distanced members join. So they told me, if I couldn't go and physically make a group in my region, which I cannot do, then that is not good enough. Well, we host a book club of our own that has 40 plus members a week. Sorry, that's not in person. Sorry, I am not able to drive a car to go and pick people up and organize something in the Pittsburgh area. But I can't. So what can we do? Well, let's be serious. You've got people who have college educations, degrees, lots of work experience under their belt organize online divisions. This isn't new. This isn't something cute and quirky and just out of the blue. People have been doing this for over a decade now with various activities. And I heard the excuse, the IMT doesn't have the manpower to do it. Find some. <laughs> I mean, it's really that simple. Take one thing off your plate and put another thing on. And for some activities that don't have any benefit, we just get rid of those things. Stuff that just doesn't have any effect, get rid of it. Don't make people do boring, pointless work forever. This is what Lenin is talking about. He's telling people to be flexible. We must do what works and more and more and more and more. See, this isn't an optional thing. It's not, oh, but and less? No, and more. And less? More. <laughs> I, I, I'm just, there's a lot of excuses out there and I'm a little pissy. I hope again, this is cathartic to people listening because when I saw and heard no as various answers, I went and did my own online and it's all free. What we make is free. We don't charge people for it. You don't have to be a paying member to join discord. You don't have to be a paying member to attend the streams. There are optional monetization things because God forbid, I mean, I live under capitalism too, and I have to 
pay my bills. So bless up to everyone that's ever donated a couple cents my way. But I'm tired of hearing of legitimate organizations just somehow not having a single brain cell in their heads to do organizational work. Organize. That's the purpose of the organization is to organize. Literally, Lenin's talking about that. The purpose of an organized body is to organize. Organize. <laughs> I, I know I sound crazy. But that's the thing. If you're listening and you're like, Kyle, you sound crazy. I would ask you to look at the interlocutors. Look at who I'm screaming about. How are any of these large groups who have actual headquarters and offices, how are they unable to do what we can do on the fly, on Discord? And there is something to be said. Small is easy to organize. That can be true. That can be true. But that just means you need to work harder and smarter. Maybe actually not as hard. Maybe you need to work smarter, not harder. There's, there's a big bad tactic. And again, I, I'm, I'm just hot in my heels with this because Lenin was just talking about this in book club, that there are activities that are fruitless that organizations are doing. He's talking about this in 1899, saying there are social Democrat organizations in Russia that are doing things that are not beneficial. We need to cut those things and we need to focus on what works. And when we find out what works, we find out more of what works and we do that. It's about moving forward. We're not making like some sort of stone temple that shall not be changed. It is tradition and it is holy and it is above reproach. No. Unwavering in principles, flexible in tactics. We're adapting, we're changing, we're critiquing, we're learning. Bringing it all together. So I hope... I hope this episode has helped some people. I don't know if there's other loose ends that I left out without it. I, I'm, I'm really fiery and I'm really passionate about this. And I want you out there to feel empowered as an individual that if you're in this world of kind of chaotic communist content out there and you're saying like, wow, why doesn't this work? Analyze that. See what the person on the other end of the keyboard is doing wrong. Because I assure you, there's probably myriads of stuff that they're doing wrong. And we can't just go like, oh, that's nice. That's wrong. That's over. I'm done. I'm walking away. No, then our task is to actually say, oh, this is what they did wrong. If this is someone I trust and can communicate with, maybe I'll help them out and say, hey, you know, this would be cool. Let me give you some feedback. And if they don't take that feedback, if they don't work with it, then you need to do it. The task is yours. There's no one to pass the baton to. It is yours. There is no more communist -y element. That's something that's been very pressing on me this last year. My, my, my most adulty growth that I've had. Um, first of all, it was when I was very young coming to communism and realizing, wow, you know, police in our society are not great people. They don't know more than the rest of us. Judges, politicians, they don't know more than the rest of us. Maybe we need to stop looking up with blind reverence at all of these figureheads, these more knowledgeable others who actually, shocker, are not more knowledgeable. We need to get over that in ourselves too. There are not more knowledgeable communist elements and entities out there. Just because someone like Infrared Hawes has a lot of followers, actually it's quite telling as to why he is not good. He has a lot of followers because his message is just blatantly wrong. It's easy for people to like because it doesn't have any critical substance to it. It's just the same thing that conservatives do. Well, I don't like those people. They look weird. Hate, hate, hate. And everyone jumps in line. Hate, 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 hate. They just all start screaming like a bunch of birds, preaching the same thing over and over. And that's what Haas does well. I mean, that's that, that's that infrared audience is they're not communists. They're fake. They're fake to the point that they're actually fascist, but they are under a red flag. Someday they will wake up. And that day is going to be bad for us because that day is the day they all shift further to the right. So again, back to that point of clowns outside the shop. We need to get rid of these pat socks because these are actually Nazis outside of our shop. And if we're wondering why other great quality leftists won't come towards us, again, if the shop is surrounded by a bunch of Hazite pat socks marching around out there, don't be surprised people aren't coming in. They see that as a bunch of Nazis. And they're like, oh, I'm not touching communism with a 10-foot pole. It's just as regressive as fascism. 
So now I hope you also see the connective tissue that the people that are Pat Sox do the work of the bourgeoisie for free. That is to say, they serve as a regressive role, a scary role, a bigoted role. We hate the gays. We hate the blacks. We hate the Jews. Rah! We don't understand any of it. We have no class consciousness at all in our heads. So rawr with us as we hate on minorities that the billionaire class told us to hate. Capitalists have made us hate the, 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 the gays for so long. They must be right. <laughs> they must be right. The capitalists must be right. They must be right. Mustn't they, dear comrades, mustn't they be right? Isn't that why we don't read Lenin and we don't read theory, we don't read Marx and we don't read Engels because the, the capitalists told us it's bad and they're right. Right? No? Then maybe again it's time we act serious and toss the trash out, not only off the internet, but out of society. It's time. The time is coming. It will be here within the next year or two. The clock is ticking. <laughs> if you can't hear it, you need to adjust the hearing aid a little bit higher because it's going loudly. Tick tock, tick tock. And our lives depend on what we're doing now. So I can't promise you that book club is going to make you the most educated communist. Who even cares what that is? The book club is here to get you understanding real Marxist theory so that when you see someone, whether it's some idiot streamer that has a 10,000 audience size or whether it's a communist party that has been established for 100 years, when you hear bullshit, horseshit coming out of their mouth, you need to know that it is fake. You don't need to have Lenin quotes memorized to say, oh, I remember all this. You simply need to know. Having the door open so that you can see a lie walk in front of your face, that gives you the skill to turn around, reference your book, understand the subject better, and go back to it prepared. I will say other things in passing here and other things in conclusion that is, Midwestern Marxist crew, whenever I went after them a few weeks ago online, I'd like to remind people that what the biggest pushback I got was from that neo-fascist crowd saying, don't criticize, don't criticize, don't criticize. Bullshit. We criticize. That's what we do. We critique. And again, the people that are getting it wrong, we're not just like, oh, <laughs> we're all friends. You can get it wrong at the expense of black people's lives. No. No, no, we make sure they know that they're wrong and not by being belligerent idiots either. I just want to be clear. You, if you're out there ever sending sort of kind of pathetic -y, just insults at other uh, Marxists that you just don't think are up to it, you're just as bad as the rest of the clowns out there. You got to have serious theory to it. Sorry if I am insulting any audience members. And, and I want to be careful as to, to, to make sure that I'm not walking in any sort of hypocritical grossness. But I can say that's something I walk away far, far from. Just the level of degenerate comments that I got from these so-called Marxists are the exact same without a single change. No flourish in the way it's written. No change. I mean, when I say 100%, I do. I'm not using it jokingly. I mean 100% pa patriotic socialists are saying the exact same phrases as neo-Nazis. Not slightly the same, not kind of sort of the same, exactly without a period out of place, the same. The same. The same mannerisms, the same insults, the same jokes, the same memes, all of it the same. These are not communists, and to any so-called comrade you might have, whether it's even just an Instagram acquaintance, that person, if they're falling for it, is not yet a comrade. And the sooner we learn to kind of tighten, the, uh, tighten the, the, the ropes here, it is going to be better for all of us. We cannot allow LARPers to continue dragging the movement down while people are being shot and killed. It cannot happen. This is where, again, we must look and say, the internet is not a joke. And for any organization or individual out there, it's like, it's online. It's going to stay there. You are the joke. You are the joke. You are the joke who is ignoring now over a decade's worth of proof to the opposite. So you're either living in la-la land or who knows where, but you're out of your head. 
<laughs> you're out of your head. You're out of your mind. Comrades, I hope this has made some sense to you. I'm going to leave it here. It's over an hour long. I have had a lot of fun. This was very cathartic to me today. I needed this. I didn't even know that I needed to put this all out there, but I'm glad I did. I'm glad I was able to use this opportunity to talk to you because there's a lot of changes that are coming soon. And this is where I also want to call out to you for help, which is we're going to get this newsletter set up through that Behiv website. We're going to use Beehive. We're going to get a newsletter going. At least I will keep up with this probably. Well, let's just say you can expect a couple of these newsletters. I'm going to be going after this path uh, as we work our way through the fall. And we'll reevaluate it later to see. All right. I, I stepped back from the newsletter this summer because I was starting to make it too big on myself. I was starting to make the tasks too, too many. I was giving myself too many loop, um, too many hoops to jump through is the word I'm looking for, the phrase. I was just making too many hoops that I had to jump through and it wasn't feeling real and it was starting to feel stale. So I want to make these smaller and more on the fly. I want to include more of the content we're doing in there, podcast recap sort of stuff so people know when there's something new. I hope you're never frustrated or annoyed at me for constantly putting out notices about podcasts and stuff. I know that that can be a little annoying, but I always am trying to showcase the work we're doing within various things, whether it's me putting them in the articles or on social media or talking about them on stream, whatever, here on the podcast. The reason I'm doing it is because it's so easy to miss it. There's so much content out there. And I'll be honest, again, it's a lot more fun for the general public to just go and, and watch someone like Hawes as he calls gay people, um, I don't know, uh, degenerate, you know, anti-communist bourgeois filth. Like, I, I, it's, it's more fun to watch someone go out there and be vulgarly wrong. It's just, it appeals to our small little human brains. But that's the thing. We as communists don't just give in to all the silly, shiny items that go past us. We are critical. We are analytical. We weigh and we pursue. We don't just believe the first thing we hear. We investigate and we read. And if those things scare you, then you've got some growing up to do first. There is a stage of people not yet being a communist. I was not yet a communist for 10 years because I was in and out. I was LARPing with no material. Then I was in college getting serious about um, making it into the capitalist space. There were no socialist things on my, in my school. So it was all heads down, you know, get out of here, get through college, get a job, get to work. And then I immediately saw capitalism dying and decaying right in front of my eyes. And for those that don't know my history, I went out there to Hollywood, to Los Angeles to live, and I worked in Hollywood as a publicist working with multimillionaires, not simply the actors, because actors are, again, rather poor people, not all of them, but most of them. Instead, a lot of my work was with financiers, which I've got to tell you, capitalists are idiots. They are dumb. They don't know how to do many things. Almost the entirety of their life is put together for them by us the working class henchmen that serve endlessly. We are the people they call at six in the morning when they want to change their flight time in an hour. They are the people they call when their hotel room is slightly the wrong shade of whatever color they wanted. Uh, no, no. We need to stop leaning into patriotic socialists who say we should lick the asses of the elite. It's, it's, it's over. The LARPing is done. The games are over. And I hope this episode starts that conversation if you want to participate in helping with the newsletters i would love people that are interested in writing whether it's opinion pieces maybe you see some news that you want to talk about and you want to write about it from a socialist communist perspective by all means if you make art music videos anything that is useful propaganda or just has aesthetic value to it, some sort of cool factor to it, please submit that too. We'd like to highlight it. Remember, we need to build out what is the cool communist culture. We need a culture, folks. That's what we're after here. We need a culture. We need people to understand helping each other is good. Working together, good. Being adversary, bad. Supporting elite policemen as they beat and torture others, bad. Trying to put it into caveman terms so people get it, right? 
Very, very simple stuff. We need a cool culture. People need to be able to look to you and see you as a communist and see you as an admirable person. And if you don't feel like you're fulfilling that, then again, I call you to your own bathroom for a five-hour conversation in front of the mirror. Don't leave until you get somewhere. Have the hard talk. What's holding you back? Is it that you don't think you're good enough? If so, read. If it's whatever other excuse under the sun, it's probably going to be the same answer and you're not going to like it, but it's probably read. Because the truth is, you will be LARPing until you understand communist theory. Even one year ago, when I was doing some of the initial work for this, I can see how I was lacking information and was filling certain gaps in as I went. This was when I was brand new. Just first baby steps onto TikTok as a leftist. You know, I already had my internal values, but I didn't have the theory to solidify and galvanize it. You know what that means? That means the moment you go out there onto that center stage, other people are going to start hammering you to see how malleable you are. And let me tell you again, if you don't have the proper treatment, if you are still malleable metal that can be bent, they're going to bend you and you will break eventually, but you will bend in the meantime. I mean, maybe, maybe you'll break. Some of them do, some of them don't. In my case, I was in a lucky position where I was surrounded by good people and I knew enough to rebuke the bad. And beyond that, though, I mean, there are things that supposed communists at the time told me that now I look back and go, well, that wasn't right of them. I understand how they got that wrong, but it wasn't right of them. And that's where I pat myself on the back and say, Kyle, thank you for being dedicated to theory too. Thank you for not just throwing the towel in on this. Maybe I'm talking to my ADHD brain here. Thank you for keeping this as a special interest and not just abandoning shit because that's what we're struggling against. It's easy to LARP. It's hard to be serious. But we're at the end and there's nowhere else to go, gang. We are in the corner. We cannot take a step back. Behind us is either a wall or a ledge. Whatever you want to think of it as, there's nowhere back to go. It's forward from here or it's death. So until next time, comrades, you stay safe, stay educated, keep learning. And if you get the chance, tell your comrades about what we're doing. Invite them to book club. And if your comrades are hesitant about learning, work on them or be serious. If you've been trying for a long time and they still won't learn, they're not comrades and you need to cut your losses before they drag you down. So again, stay safe, educate yourself, and agitate. Bye-bye.